So this is Catherine Lambrick, Chicago Foodways Roundtable. It's our October meeting. We it's like this year's gone so fast. Unbelievable. Our program tonight, um, Feeding the Art Deco Spirit, was recommended to me by uh, Colleen Sen, who um, had uh, heard this program um, earlier this year. And uh, and then I and then she goes, it's Terry Edelstein. You know her, right? I, I know the face. I just didn't put everything together. But tonight and so she's been a long-term member of culinary historians i just i just didn't know everything that she was but now i do uh, anyway Ter dr terry edelstein is curator and museum consultant and is principal of terry j edelstein museum strategies she served as deputy director of the art institute of chicago and before that as director of the david and alfred smart museum of art and the mount holyoke college art museum She's taught at Yale University, Mount Holyoke College, and the University of Chicago. Her numerous publications include many articles and exhibition catalogs, as well as the book, Art for All, British Posters for Transport. She contributed a major essay to Art Deco Chicago, Designing Modern America. Most recently, she curated everyone's art gallery posters of the London Underground for the Art Institute of Chicago and contributed an essay to the book E. McKnight Coffer, The Artist in Advertising. And from talking to her recently, she seems to be an excellent cook. And fortunately, I have something she wants. I'm going to go visit her. And we're going to, I'm going to teach her how I make a pie crust. So it's always fun to be able to offer something to people who are so talented. So, Terry, I'm turning it over to you. Um, I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled to do this for the culinary historians of Chicago. And I'm especially thrilled by my promised honorarium, which is my lesson from Kathy. That's like the best honorarium I've ever had. Um, so I'm particularly excited about that. And thank you very much, Kathy. I'm looking forward to that. Now, I spent most of the pandemic doing research and publications and lectures related to Art Deco and also cooking and baking for my husband and myself and many friends. So I decided that it would be fun to explore the intersection of these two interests. This topic touches upon a central aspect of the culture and lifestyle of the 1920s and 30s. After the privations of World War I, the economies of the US and most European countries improved. Food became far more plentiful and was infused with glamor. Many aspects of food preparation, serving, and eating were affected by the new mode of representation that developed in these years. The style we now call Art Deco began to develop around 1914. It emphasized geometric shapes and streamlined forms. As you will see, you could exist in an entire Art Deco world where everything from the soup to the nuts was inflected with this style. It encompasses where one prepares food. And I'm showing you here, um, two different kitchens of the era. And where one eats, whether in private spaces, such as this breakfast nook designed for himself by John Wellborn Root for 1301 Astor, his apartment there, or in grand spaces, such as this official dining room that was exhibited at the Paris World's Fair in 1925. In exclusive luxury, such as the mirror room in our own Women's Athletic Club in Chicago, or enormous public places, such as the original dining room of Eaton's department store in Montreal. Restaurants in deco style proliferated in Paris, where you see the outside and inside of the famous restaurant Prunier or in Paris on the Prairie at Jacques, 
that was once on Michigan Avenue and that we see here immortalized in a Kurt Teich postcard. Art Deco proliferated even in restaurants that were moving. And I'm showing you now the first class dining room of the magnificent Normandy Ocean Liner. Art Deco can be seen in dining furniture and the table settings upon it. And these are just a few of the myriad uh, table ceramics that were created in the Art Deco style. This, if I have a single favorite object in my uh, talk, it's probably this plate by Jean Luce. We see Art Deco in the machines to cook food. We see its manifestation in menus perused and in cookbooks to instruct. We find Art Deco in shops to buy food and in suggestions for purchases. And through the miracle of um, PowerPoint, I was able to add this fabulous poster that my husband just found yesterday for me, which is advertising a cooking oil in the Netherlands. The Exposition des Arts Décoratifs, which was held in Paris in 1925, is the source of the name Art Deco and the scene of a great flowering of the style. It was primarily intended to promote French luxury design and many prominent French firms whose creations related to the serving and consumption of food were there. Here are just a few, Sev in a pavilion that was uh, designed by Lalique and here's a display from one of the department stores, the Studium Louvre. Great works of art, decorative art, were created in deco style to facilitate the serving of food all over the world. Here are some cake plates from uh, Germany, from the collection of the Kunst und Gewerbe Museum in Hamburg, which is an extraordinarily a great museum. Here's a tea set from Japan done in Art Deco style. And another great favorite, this set specifically made to serve antipasto uh, done when he was quite young by the great book illustrator, Bruno Minari. There's many things like this, but in order to make this topic manageable for this brief discussion, I'm going to confine myself to a few examples in books and other printed works. Choosing such works has the added advantage of suggesting how the deco style spread throughout the world and became something of a universal style. In France, during the deco period, there were many portfolios and they have names with titles, I've translated them into English, titles like Living Architecture, A Miscellany of Modern Taste, International Art of Today, and there were a great many of these. They documented designs such as dishes and glassware by well-known designers. Many of them included spaces for eating and drinking such as in the repertoire de, du, de goût moderne. The burgeoning of the economy in the recovery from World War I meant a proliferation of stores, shops, cafes, bars, and restaurants. And many of these featured the work of prominent designers. And I'm showing you here a bar and a dining room designed by Charlotte Perrion. And here is a very elegant casino um, designed by Robert Malley Stevens. The scale and elegance of his pale blue and yellow casino gives a sense of the luxury that pervaded much of this style. These port two portfolios entitled cafes, bars, and restaurants exemplify a literal consumer culture 
as we see the patrons eagerly eating and drinking such creations as this lobster. And here you can see it a little more close up. The books and prints of the artist Jean-Emile Laboureur depicted every conceivable venue where one could satisfy one's hunger, often in stylish settings. He depicted cafes, bistros, and taverns. But Laboureur depicted a wide range of customers. You'll note the wooden sabo shoes um, on the patrons in the tavern on the right. And these people would have been rather out of place in the great uh, casino of Robert Malley Stevens, which I showed you a moment ago. In a book entitled Plaisir or Pleasures, this book was published as a piece of advertising by a pharmaceutical company and included chapters by many different artists, several of which touch upon the pleasures of food, not surprisingly in France. In Laboureur's own contribution, En Route or the Pleasures of Travel, the enjoyments of voyages often included eating, of course. His use of the lithographic crayon echoes the pointillism of earlier artists like Seurat to create compositions in red and blue. A blue soda siphon sits at the center of a group of self-satisfied men, while a barmaid, Manet-like, and I'm showing you Manet's bar at the Folie Bergère of some years earlier, looks on impassively. The staccato accent of the palms on the right form a canopy above the men, and in a typical laborer touch, the stasis of the scene is broken by the patron in the upper left, awkwardly putting on his coat. Of course, all of these diners had to decide what to eat. After reviewing the entire online collection of menus of the New York Public Library from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, I concluded that the deco style was seen primarily in the menus of ocean liners. Perhaps because these ships used up to the minute decor and a unity of style as a way of attracting passengers. But the 2,350 menus in this part of the collection are by no means exhaustive. And I hasten to add reflect the taste and collecting of the person who put together the collection. Now, because of the Herculean efforts of volunteers, it's very easy to review the dishes on offer. I'm showing you um, a selection of this particular menu um, from the menu SS Penland from 1927. But when you go on to this collection, if you're interested, every one of the menus has a typed form of the menu, which has been transcribed by volunteers. Now, I did not review the contents of all 2000 plus of these menus, but a sampling that I did reveals that the food listed in the menus with deco graphic design did not vary from that of menus with more conventional design nor was the food of the 1920s and 30s wildly different from the food in other decades. I looked in, for example, in the 1910s and the 1940s. Of course, although it's very prominent, deco style is not confined to the menus of ocean liners, as we can see in this menu for 1933 for the Black Hawk restaurant in Chicago. And this is a particular, particularly charming composition. I, I especially like the foot coming in from the right-hand side and the kiss about to happen um, on the upper left edge. The inhabitants of this deco world also searched for food to purchase. 
Here, La Barreur exploits the velvetiness of soft ground etching to capture plump and leafy produce and plump appreciative shoppers. Oscar Wilde's Dorian Gray is one of the frequenters of markets in London. The inhabitants of La Barreur's world can get food at grocery stores, from a seller of oysters, or from a shop selling cooked meats. Of course, the fashionably dressed Parisienne depicted in this print know that no meal is complete without a few pastries. I'd like you to note how La Barreur includes both the geometries of the pastries themselves and the almost Cuba city that you see through the windows. The calm of the pastry shop is contrasted with the cacophonies of the modern city. La Barreur was not the only artist of the period to depict shops selling food. In 1925, the writer Pierre Mac Orlin, the artist Lucien Boucher, and publisher Marcel Seher, who had met during World War I in a German prison camp, created Boutique, in which we most definitely see the privations of the world left behind. It treats us to frontal compositions in bright color lithography, announcing various shops, many of them selling food. We can see a shop selling horse meat, one selling tripe, wine and liquor, bread, ice creams and meats, and vegetables. Here's the ice cream, the charcuterie, and the butcher shop, the boucherie. Here, the seller of vegetables strongly uh, resembles her wares. The same trio followed this book with another the next year called Boutique de la Foire, whose frontispiece features a pig roasting for the festivities. This is a little pixelated. What you can't may, might not be able to see is that the pig has a big smile on his face. So I guess he's perfectly happy being roasted so we can eat him. Appropriately for a fun fair, there was food. There was most often sugary sweets. For example, the, the merchant of nougat sold by an exotic vendor wearing a fez. On the right-hand side, a chef is pulling so forcefully to stretch and create hard candy that the B in the word berlingo or hard candy has gone completely out of the frame on the left-hand side and all you see is erlingo instead of berlingo. Other shops are readying moule et frite, mussels and french fries, and we are told that the mechanical patisserie on the right will churn out brioche, tarts, crackers, and waffles. In 1925, Mac Orlin also collaborated with the illustrator Henri Guillac on a book called Opening Soon, Prochainement, Prochainement Overture. This depicts shopkeepers. And because this is France, um, many of the shopkeepers have shops selling food. Every one of the shopkeepers is a famous author or at least authors who were famous in 1925. And I confess that I had not heard of a great many of them. This being France, no matter what the title of the book, The Death of the Beast or Italy, Italy, they are actually shops, proprietors of shops selling food. So appropriately, the writer of the book, Mac Orlin himself, um, is the proprietor of a shop selling dead fish. This is the name of a 1917 novel that he wrote 
les poissons more. And here you see beside him, Henri Gide lounging in front of a store called Fruits of the Earth, which was the name of a prose poem by him published in 1897. Now what assumes, this is again a selection of uh, some of the illustrations from Boutique, the first book that I talked about. And if you look at these, I think you will agree, and I've put them up in order, the vegetables and the butcher, um, that you will see that the illustrator of this book, uh, a woman named Natalie Perrin, most likely knew these earlier books when she created this book called Fête Votre Marché, Make Your Market. It's a very sweet children's book. There are full pages of illustrating the various food stores. And then in the back of the book are perforated things where you can cut out the things that you bought at the store. You can cut out your cake or your oranges and you can stick them in a little shopping basket. Perrin was born in Kiev and she introduced a fellow group of emigre artists to the publisher Flammarion that created the distinctive look of the children's book series, Père Castor. It also seems logical that the works of both Boucher and Perrin were known to the British artist, Eric Revillius, when he created High Street in 1938. And again, a number of the shops in High Street have to do with the purveying or selling of food. Of course, once one has bought food, one often cooks it. And manuals of instruction proliferated in this period, often with illustrated dust jackets and interior illustrations. Laborer himself illustrated a number of works um, done by an old friend of his that he served with in World War I. Um, both Laboureur and Boulestin, who were both fluent in English, served as translators for the British Expeditionary Force, a British Expeditionary Force that served in Flanders and France. And here you see three of the cookbooks illustrated by Laboureur for his old friend, Boulestin, who had settled in London and ultimately opened a restaurant. And here are a few more illustrations from two other cookbooks done by Boulestin. He was a very prolific cookbook author. Another reason that cookbooks tantalized me was the possibility of finding actual food in the Art Deco style. Edward Bauden, a fellow student with Revilius and a lifelong friend, created more than 10 covers for books by Ambrose Brose Heath, covering such topics as good food, vegetables, good potato dishes, and good savories, which I showed at the beginning of the lecture. Despite the, de despite the deco inflected designs for on the cover of the book, Good Sweets, the molds that are used to make this kind of, in England, they're called jelly. We call them jello molds, but in England, they're called jelly. Um, these jelly molds and cake molds look very deco. They have this geometry, this form reduced to repeating geometric form, the simplification that is very typical of deco. But in fact, the molds that I'm showing you and the molds depicted on the cover of the book were created in the Victorian period um, in the 19th century. So they, are, they, are, they look deco, but they are not actually deco. Now, I, in looking for cookbooks, I went through the uh, catalog of cookbooks in the Creerar Library of the University of Chicago for the 1920s and 30s. And I was very excited when I found the 1939 title, 
streamlined cooking because I hoped that in that I would find other examples of streamlined food. I already knew this wonderful example, which I thought was a quite inspired inclusion into the book, um, Art Deco Chicago, Designing Modern America. Um, this is the Twinkie, of course. Invented in Chicago, the Twinkie is a filled version of something called Hostess Dessert Fingers that promised, quote, no ragged edges or uneven corners, end quote. And I hoped that streamlined cooking would include more dishes in this streamlined shape. But the subtitle of the book, New and Delightful Recipes for Canned, Packaged and Frosted Foods and Rapid Recipes for Fresh Foods told me that as I turned the pages of the book, I was not going to find food in the Art Deco shape. You undoubtedly will recognize the names of Irma Rombauer and Marion Rombauer Becker um, because this book followed just by a few years, um, Irma Rombauer's Joy of Cooking. One of the other problems in finding actual Art Deco food is that very few of the cookbooks of this era featured illustrations. Inspired by the fact that Art Deco is primarily a style of wealth and luxury, I decided to get down off the shelf the cookbook entitled Fancy Salads in, of the Big Hotels, which was published in New York. And here in the numerous grainy illustrations, I found a sensibility that echoed the submission of natural forms to geometry that characterizes Art Deco. These chefs used vegetables and fruit to recreate forms which really hearkened to some of the most famous designers in the Art Deco style. And I'm comparing the coronation pear salad and the salad of um, eggs and tomatoes um, with some of the works created by Edgar Brandt. And it's interesting to note that Brandt actually had a showroom in New York um, where these salads were created. But even greater pertinence are the creations of Bernard Lembrecht. And I give thanks to my friend, Martha Fleischman, who when she knew I was working on this lecture, um, sent me um, information about this book. The son of a pastry chef, Lembrecht trained in a little town called Wolfenbüttel, Germany, not far from um, Weimar, and then directed the school there. His school published his book, Vom Neuen Stil in der Konditorei Kunst, probably in the year 1929. This is the English translation from the following year. Lembrecht saw his confections and his teachings as an extension of a philosophy. And certainly his philosophy and stylistic tenets are inspired by the Bauhaus School, founded in Weimar in 1919. Lembrecht notes in his introduction, quote, the new era is beginning to impress its style on every circumstance of life, and the, end quote. And that of course includes the food itself. He aspires to adapt baking in appearance to, quote, the present times, end quote. He cares about technique, economy, taste, and cleanliness, which all form the basis for the combination of pastries with, quote, artistic ability and taste of marked individuality. Now I'm comparing here Lembrecht's cakes with a plate designed by the Bauhaus-trained Margareta Hyman, 
and another plate created in Germany at exactly the same time that Lembrecht was creating the designs for his cake. His book was published in English probably in 1930 as the new style of confectionery. And I showed the cover a moment ago and some of you with good eyesight might have noticed that it was published in Glasgow and London. And I would dearly love to know how this self-published book from Wolfenbrudel, Germany was translated and published in Glasgow. I was very tempted to attribute the place of publication um, to the presence of the renowned Glasgow School of Art in Glasgow, whose philosophy and style was an influence to the Bauhaus itself. And the gra a graduate of the school and the designer of its now tragically lost uh, school building is an artist named Charles Rennie McIntosh, who was very well known and much revered by European modernists. He even did a design for a house in Berlin in 1901. And I'm showing you as a comparison to a detail of this hazelnut gateau by um, Herr Lembrecht, um, a window from that house in Berlin by Mackintosh, and then another window by him from um, Hill House in Glasgow. But Mackintosh's work, his designs were widely published and widely available in Europe, um, beginning in the uh, late early 20th century. But the more I researched it, it turns out that the place of publication was a complete coincidence and there is no real relationship, um, but it was still fun to think about it. Um, I also am showing you now a comparison of um, Lembrecht's cakes to two French designs, um, which I showed before from the repertoire de Gou Moderne. And I'm showing you these, um, not because I think Mr. Lembrecht, Herr Lembrecht necessarily looked at these plates from the repertoire de, de Gou Moderne, although he could have done, um, but I'm rather showing them to you as a way of indicating that the motifs that he's using in the cake decoration were by this time, the beginnings of a real universal style that we see um, in, another, in other places. And if we needed, here's another detail from the repertoire, this one by Francis Jordan. And I think you can see there is a relationship. And again, I'm not postulating that, that Lembrecht actually looked at these plates, but just to show that there is a continuity of style. And the international manifestations of that style, um, we can see them even in Chicago um, with these two compacts that were produced by Elgin American in Elgin, Illinois. Um, I myself was wondering what one of the cakes um, would look like, one of these German cakes would look like on a German cake plate of almost exactly the same uh, date as the cookbook. Now, I've spent most of my time talking about the feeding part of my title. So I thought I would spend the last few minutes talking about the quote unquote spirit of Art Deco, which you are about to figure out, I meant in both a literal and metaphoric way. The bubbles, fizz, and effervescence of champagne seems to lend itself particularly to the sinewy lines of Art Nouveau. Fewer memorable Art Deco images promote the drink. The sparkle of the drink of champagne implied a good time in many contexts. And in in Antonio Petrocelli, demonstrates the power of the beverage to bring a good year, an actual good fortune, we might say, in one of his powerful covers created for that eponymous magazine. 
fortune. But if champagne buoyed the gaiety of the Belle Epoque, then the signature beverage of the jazz age was the cocktail. We can see this theme in a print here by La Bourreur in which you see people conversing and then all the different things one needs to make a cocktail um, spread out on the table in front of them. And we can see this theme in another marvelous image um, from a book by uh, the illustrator, artist and illustrator, Thomas Lewinsky, that was published in London in 1930. It's a marvelous book entitled Modern Nymphs, in which various nymphs from antiquity are translated in the contemporary, into the contemporary age. And it's quite delightful to see Circe in an appropriate setting with this tubular furniture, um, preparing drinks for Odysseus and the rest of the fleet whom you can see coming in um, from the left-hand side out the window. Even food um, depicted in this time period um, seems to be created in the geometry of Art Deco. Of course, America particularly embraced the concoctions of the cocktail because the country had just been liberated from prohibition, which lasted from January 17, 1920 until December 5, 1933. And I assume no one in America drank um, when liquor was illegal. Here we see the January 1934 issue of the sophisticated magazine for men, Esquire, founded the previous year in Chicago. You can see the enthusiasm of their sort of mascot, Esky, who is practically diving into a cocktail glass. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing you a cocktail shaker made by the company, the Napier Company in Meriden, Connecticut, that was created in the image of Esky. It's not a totally good likeness. He looks more like a snowman, but I think the intention was clearly that it would be um, Esky. And there were, the cocktail shaker, of course, was the significant um, object uh, connected with the drink. And here are a few European cocktail shakers. And of course, after prohibition was list, lifted, um, we see a number of cocktail shakers created in America. The cocktail was indeed um, a worldwide phenomenon, even depicted in Japanese prints. And I'm currently working on a, another article which will um, talk about that specifically. How-to manuals proliferated. Here's one called Shake Em Up. But the most superlative um, masterpiece of the genre of how-to books about cocktails, judged by its provenance, the knowledge of its author, its comprehensiveness, and not least the quality of its design and production was the Savoy cocktail book. It's a law and energy is trumpeted by the cover where the cocktail imbibed is a, becomes a gold lightning bolt descending past the heart of the drinker. And the lively geometric pattern on the right gives a sense of the excitement that awaits the reader. Savoy in the title refers to the Savoy Hotel in London. Inspired by a visit to the Paris Fair in 1925, the management of the Savoy commissioned Howard Robinson to create a new facade in the current Art Deco style. Authored by British-born Harry Craddock, who had emigrated to the United States many years earlier, becoming a renowned barman in New York at the Knickerbocker Hotel, but in 1920, when prohibition was enacted, 
he returned to England. And this book touted his position as head bartender of the American bar in the hotel. Because of Craddock's fame, the bar became an in place to drink. The decorations by Gilbert Rumboldt complement the recipes for 750 different cocktails and other concoctions like slings and juleps, giving a sense of the energy and style of the drinks. And here you see in one of the illustrations, a female race car driver. The illustrations frequently reference specific cocktails. The Commodore cocktail is illuminated with waving flags and a precision dance line of sailors. Slinky gold diggers grace pages, as does, as the, the um, text describes it, a cocktail party in the very best manner of the period. We see the jolt of thunder and lightning, and you feel almost tipsy as a biplane careens through the sky. What better way to embody the excitement of a drink called a fizz than with the dynamic cityscape of skyscrapers? So I hope that you enjoyed the lecture and I look forward to your questions. And I hope that everyone will join me in saying cheers to Art Deco. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I was glad you mentioned the Lambrecht there. Yes, yes, exactly. I actually own that book. Do you? Do yes. You? It's a wonderful, wonderful book. And he gives descriptions of how, of course, you know, he gives descriptions of how he makes the cakes. The, that round circle was um, glossade pears and almonds. And he, it, it's, it's quite wonderful to read, read the cookbook. And, so, and there's nice color plates in there. Yes, it's very beautifully printed, unlike that salad book, which it's hard to even, you know, make out what what is in it. Um, so I, I hope some people have questions. I'm I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, well, I guess. Oops, I just knocked off chat. Um, I think they're still they're still reeling with information. <laughs> uh, I know Margaret Margaret Carney is here or was here. Let me see if she is. I was wondering if she wanted to um, make a comment. Margaret, I'll let you unmute and you could decide. Because she's very interested in anything and everything. Hello, Hi. Margaret. Hi. <laughs> I loved it. Oh, thank you so much. I love the thank dishes. You, so you reminded me of people I still want to collect and you made me so hungry and I already had dinner. <laughs> now <laughs> well, I want to drink. <laughs> then I succeeded. Yeah, it was wonderful. The illustrations in the, the cookbooks and the cocktail book and uh, everything were just fantastic. Oh, thank you so much. Very enjoyable. Well, people don't know. Margaret has presented to us at least twice before, and you're the what president and founder of the International Dinnerware Museum. I'm director and curator, but a president, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you might as well honor people, right? When you don't always remember the title. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was fabulous. Well, uh, Carrie Tilly said you had me Googling for the Savoy cocktail book only to learn they are in the multiple thousands of dollars. Well, in fact, if you go online to Amer Antiquarian Book Exchange, um, you will find that there are several reprints of the Savoy cocktail book. Um, and some of them are done very, very well. And they're not expensive. Um, and if you're looking for one, if you would like to buy one, um, go online and find yourself what the actual cover looks like and be sure that you buy a reproduction 
that you can see is the full size of the book with the entire cover of the book repro reproduced because I own, I own, I'm very lucky. My husband many years ago bought the original of the Savoy cocktail book and we have one purchased a long time ago in beautiful condition. So it's in such perfect condition that I decided we really should get a reproduction of it. Um, and I learned that there are different qualities of the reproduction and that some of them are not reproduced full size. So that's what you want to look out for. I don't know, Carrie, if you want to make a comment, but I know you're such a collector of all things silver. I, I'm, I'm a silver junkie. And yeah, I have, I have two sterling silver uh, cocktail shakers that are in the, the deco. Um, I'm also, I have a master's in fine art. So my, my food interest um, bleeds over into design as well. But I was also looking at my Lucius Beebe cookbook because it has a very deco cover, but it is 1947. And um, so he was definitely inspired by that um, same right. man era of, uh, of, of deco cocktailing. Yes, I, I did, um, I gave this lecture originally for the Caxton Club, which is a book collector's club in Chicago and for the Chicago Art Deco Society. And the Caxton Club asked me to write something for their little uh, journal. And I expanded on the cookbooks. And there are in fact, a tremendous number of cookbooks with fabulous deco um, covers primarily, but also with interior illustrations. Um, but again, they don't have food that we would define as being art deco. They're just using the contemporary deco style to- I think I have a good half dozen deco covers, but you're right, there's no illustrations or design that- Right, uh, well, I'd love, if you'd be willing to share with me, I'd love to see some of the other um, deco oh, covers sure. that you found because I'd love, I found, I found a number that I didn't illustrate in this particular lecture. You can just, I could have talked for, if I showed all the dishes I had found and all the everything I had found, I would be talking for you know six or eight hours, and I didn't think anybody wanted to listen to me. I'm, I'm impressed that you found the cakes. I that I had not seen those before, but I will. Well, I will. I, as I said, those were found for me by my dear friend Martha <laughs> Fleischman. I don't. I I then bought that cookbook so that I would have it, but I don't know that I would have ever discovered that without her. I'll get your contact info from oh, thank uh, you. That would Catherine be and send you send you a few pics of my cookbook covers. I'm looking over that. at my shelf. I would be very grateful for that. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Oh yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, Anne inquired, what did you discover about trends in colors in tableware during the Art Deco period? I can't say that that I discovered. The, the only thing that I would say is there are, particularly in England, and there are big variations between France and England, but particularly in England, um, there's a, a lot of use of very, very bright color. You don't find that in quite the same way in, in France, but in England, there, there is in, in the great um, Deco, uh, Ceramicus Claris Cliff, Burslem Pottery, um, Carter Stabler and Pool. Um, there are a number of things, and and many of those are are more brightly colored than. And I showed a a dinner set in the lecture on the right. That that image on the right was by Susie Cooper, but you notice the plate on the left um, by Suzanne Haviland. Um, and then that wonderful fish plate that I showed by Jean Luce, um, those are more, much more restrained. Do we have some additional questions here? I I, anyway, I just want to tell you how I did acquire that Lambrecht book. Oh, how um, did I did a, I had a I had a search on um, on eBay for my last name. So I've picked up a bunch of stuff that very interesting and some of it, well, <laughs> who cares? I mean, it's like a fish fly, is, a fish his fly. Last, his last name is very close to yours. Very, very it's close. It's exactly my name. 
isn't his it's it's how do you spell your last well, name you oh you, you it was l-a-m-b-r-e-c-h-t i know there's variations with a p instead of a b but i think he's b-r-e it's but it's l he's l-e-m but it's very close okay i'll take a look at the I book think he is lem lembrecht so but it's very very close indeed you're very lucky to have that book it's a wonderful wonderful book and, and i bought it before people seemed to realize it was something to get because i got it very inexpensively yes that's the secret to be first off the block that that's definitely the secret and it was just totally vanity on my part that i even got it <laughs> but so. you lucked out I With sure did. I sure did. Does anybody else have any more questions? I think people are, you know, when you do a very thorough job like you did, sometimes there is no question to ask. Well, thank everybody. I thank everybody for attending and thank you for um, saying those nice things of how much you uh, enjoyed the lecture. I'm very grateful to you. All righty. Well, I think Good. that's it. But you know what? It was wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I enjoyed it. And we all did too. And uh, I'll come to visit very soon. Great. We'll arrange that. I'm looking forward to it. Me Thanks too. Thanks a lot. Good night. Thank everyone. you. Good night. Oh, wait. Carrie has a question. Wait. Oh, okay. Carrie, are you raising your hand? No. Oh, you're just doing. Oh, she's clapping virtually. Sorry. Oh, that's very <laughs> kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> you're so very, very welcome. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye bye.